Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free, and that's thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting your favorite podcast and becoming a patron, please check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. There's currently over 230 patrons supporting the mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media. Take action now and become one of them. All patrons will get their name on a dedicated patrons page on the Tough Girl website and all female patrons five dollars and above are invited to join the closed Facebook group the Tough Girl Tribe. Today I am so excited to share this episode with you. We are speaking to Rosie Swale Pope MBE. She is a legendary global adventurer, author and motivational speaker. Throughout her life Rosie has completed numerous marathons in some of the world's most challenging terrains and has embarked upon many adventures including riding across Chile on horseback and sailing across the globe in a small boat. In 2003, age 57, she began a five-year run around the world, traveling 20,000 miles to raise awareness for the early diagnosis of cancer. Rosie is the only person in the world to have completed this solo challenge unsupported, carrying all of her belongings in her cart behind her. Now at the age of 72, Rosie has taken on an exciting new challenge, a run of 6,000 miles from Brighton, United Kingdom, all the way to Kathmandu in Nepal, in support of the charity Phase Worldwide and their work in remote areas of the Himalayas. Enjoy this episode. I didn't edit it at all. I just let Rosie speak. She is just such a wonderful, wonderful woman. Enjoy. Rosie, how are you? I'm really well, thanks, Sarah, and it's a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, it's so lovely to talk to you. And we were having a bit of a chat before we started. I was like, I've got to hit the record button because we're missing like so much good stuff. But Rosie, do you just want to tell everybody where, where you currently are in the world and describe the environment that you're, that you're in? Well, I'm, I'm 26 miles inside the border of Serbia and it's quite remote. Uh, I've got no Wi-Fi. I can't do any phone calls except very, very expensively. But I, did, I just bought a little extra data from my server to talk to you. And it's boiling hot. God knows how does farmers work in the heat because it's very humid and it is amazingly hot. You just drip sweat all day long. It's worse than I found Death Valley. And it's considerably worse than the heat in other in various deserts I've been in, like the Sahara. But I found a patch of shade. And also, and it's always covered in dust because for some reason, it's very dusty and muddy when it's because there's thunderstorms and so you should see me I look like a little street urchin here and I've got lots of friends including my little friends the ants I you can never get rid of them so you have to train them to go away so I make a little little patch of breadcrumbs a little bit of a distance off from my buggy and then they never bother coming to me you see I, I use the same trick on the wild dogs I've met on various parts of my journey you know if you give them a little bit of bread to bite they bite that instead of your legs the only thing it doesn't work with is mosquitoes because they just they just love they just love to get real close <laughs> oh I bet they do so Rosie tell everybody why you're currently 26 miles inside Serbia what what current what's your current challenge that you're on at the moment well I am running from Brighton to Kathmandu for a very small but wonderful charity I rather use that widely I should say organization because they try to help people help themselves called phase worldwide I'm a patron of this charity i never, never done this before. Uh, I've, I obviously, I'm always promoting cancer awareness. And indeed, I promote everything awareness. I'm doing it for everybody. But these people are fantastic because my start in life was quite hard, you could say. And I'm very grateful to my mother, who was dying of TB, of actually giving birth to me anyway. And then, bless her, though I never knew her, she went, apparently, I found 50 years later, through 45 applicants to find a foster mum for me, which was in Davos, Switzerland, because she was in a TB clinic. And then my grandmother took over and we were not at all wealthy because uh, it was in Ireland. And, and then as now, I, but anyway, there was no kind of insurance for medical things and she, she could not walk. But, you know, I was so always unhappy when people sort of gave us things and my grandmother wouldn't like it. And, you know, the main thing is you just felt a little bit Great, very grateful, but also very sort of wretched as accepting things. But my grandmother told me you can get round things and do things yourself. 
And this is a van going past. There's hardly any traffic here. They must wonder what this person is sitting on a patch of dusty grass here is doing. But anyway, so she's taught me things like when your feet get too big, you know, you just cut your, your shoes and extra increasingly sexy sandals, like many, many hundreds and thousands of people do worldwide still. And you can get round things. We used to be bunching flowers because I wanted to buy a horse. And I never did actually get to buy a horse. <laughs> but I did get to ride the family cow to the, to the horse show. And she ate the judge's hat and kicked down all the fences. But we got a prize anyway. And so, you know, I learned you can get round things because I certainly am not the only amazing thing about me is that very, very ordinary, and that's it. Oh, Rosie, I'm definitely sure that that is not the case. But so, tell us more about about this. Chat. Where did this idea come from? So, running from Brighton in England all the way to Kathmandu. Yes, now this is so good. This I understand now. I mean, even better, why you're so good at what you do? Because I can go on forever. I've had such a very long, long, long life. But no, I. I'm proud to do this. It's a about 10 years ago, or I ran 20,000 miles around the world self-supported. This was like the package tour on foot. It was the cheapest way I could do it, which was also the coldest, and through Russia and Siberia. And it's a long, long story. I wrote a book about it and did lots of stuff about it. But obviously, along the way, I learned how to look after myself. Uh, like this little buggy I've got now is like a boat. It's got stores on it. It's got things for solar power, etc. So many years later, uh, in fact, a year, year and a half ago, I had a, a, a silly accident. I had damaged my left hip many times falling on the blue ice in the Arctic on various crazy expeditions. But I just finished a project on the seafront in Brighton and Hove, and I decided to go to the laundry. This was on near New Year's Eve 2017, and I slept on the smallest puddle anyone ever saw, and it must have been waiting for attention forever. And I broke my left hip, sheer broke it. And so I thought, because I was then 70 or maybe 71, I can't remember, something like that. That means the new 21, of course. I then realized that I was, you know, they, I was so lucky. I love and I'd always honor the NHS beyond everything because it's, because I had good, strong bones. Instead of putting hip replacement, which would be the normal thing for a 70-year-old, they pinned it, this fantastic surgeon and those team – just before New Year's Eve, I was in hospital before the start of 2018 and still seems I would walk with a limp forever and I would never run because it had had a bad, a bad break. But instead, um, I stayed at a, a lovely campsite where I just sat in the tent and they spoiled me rotten and I kind of rested the leg but kept moving about getting looking after myself and so I was able to go to Texas and fetch my buggy back because I'd run across America with this little cart I call Ice Chick and then I, I freighted it back from Dallas after running on my crutches a hundred and something miles I think it was and then so later I was going to I, I know this I mean, may sound this is hard to follow but I'd just before I'd broken my hip one of my books had come out in Berlin, in German language edition, and a very, very charming, sweet publishers, ever so lovely, young people, and had been looking forward to me coming, and I had to put it off because I had a broken hip. And as you know, Sarah, even King Canute can't control the tides, and nobody can control how fast or how slow your hip breaks, uh, men's or any bone does. So I put it off. So I thought, well, I'll be able to do it anyway. So about Oh, last summer, just over a year ago, I set off from Brighton and I didn't know what would happen. I was pulling ice chick. I was still very grateful to people at the Hove Prom Park Run and all the community in Brighton and Hove and my wonderful son, James, and my daughter. Everybody was great to me. So I set off for Berlin and I got stronger and stronger. Amazing. And I, I took a long time, but I arrived in Berlin just before Christmas and I got an amazing welcome. And I was I was so overcome with joy. And then a, another thing happened after that. And that was I kind of had an idea in my mind of revisiting some of the places that I'd been before. Like, you know, I'd sailed around Cape Horn and later I'd ridden, uh, for, I think it was 1400 miles down Chile on horseback. 
by myself to go back to Cape Horn Island to say thank you to the lighthouse men. Plus, I've been in South Africa for the Comrades race. Plus, my son was born on board uh, our boat so many years ago in Fumicino, off uh, near Rome. Plus, many, many other things happened to me that were significant and I felt so grateful for. And I thought, I'll do a little gentle journey around the world and I'll make it a multifaceted journey, like I'll come home to see my family because I haven't got time to do everything so, uh, one after the other anymore. So I've got to do it all at once. And then an amazing thing happened. In, it was in March. I came home specially to give a talk uh, for Phase Worldwide in Cumbria. And I was the keynote speaker and I, very sweet people. And then next day, uh, Jonathan Scorer, who you've spoken to, he's an events director or director of many, you know, he's, he's one of the wheelers and sort of movers and shakers in this very, very small charity. He said, Would you, why don't you run to Kathmandu for us? And I suddenly thought... Wow, because do you know something? There's people there that just have so little. And I just said, yes, because I thought it's not about the past. The past is great, but the past comes along into the future and becomes part of it, doesn't it, Sarah? I thought, hey, I will run the Kathmandu. And it ought to be pretty cool because now I'm so old, like the dog playing the piano. Surely, you know, it'll be interesting enough to get a little sponsorship. So, do, and I'm sure Jonathan has told you, but it's, what is it? www.rosyruns.co.uk. Now, this is the first time I've ever said it on, on air because I, I always forget. But I thought, I'll do it. And then it, I realized it was going to be all the way around the world again. And so I realized, too, that we in this Western world, we have many physical things. Like even after the last journey, I couldn't get over. You could turn a tap on. And turn it off. You didn't have to recycle water about six times like I do now, you know, going from my face down to my socks. And you can turn the light on and you seem to have fairly easy things like temperature control. But in other ways, we're very poor because life is very confusing. And sometimes and many people have in not just the invisible wounds we're hearing about, the mental problems and everything, but just physical stresses and, you know, a, I, 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 I mean, a wolf put his head in my tent when I was in Siberia, but actually stress truly kills more people than wolves with furry paws and big long teeth. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, basically we're not giving. I, I, if we do something like uh, help the people in Nepal, they've already outsmarted us. They can teach the people in the Western world a lot because they're rich in resilience and, and pride and courage. And but they some of them have never had the chance to go to school and they're brilliantly hardworking. But this charity gets some seeds like, you know, to so they can or agricultural methods. So now instead of getting food from the villages uh, several days away, they're selling food to the villages. Isn't that great? So I thought I'll do I'll go around the world again and I will start by going from uh, on the road. I w won't go back to start again because I've had many send-offs in my life and it's the end, not the beginning that counts. So I, I decided to keep going from Berlin and go from Berlin. I ran to Prague, through all through the Czech Republic, which was quite difficult because some of the footpaths kind of end suddenly, but they're very nice people, to Linz, where I did a project and eventually did some talks in German, even though I don't really speak German. <laughs> amazing what you can do. And then Vienna, where I had an amazing welcome, and then to Bratislava and Gyur and Budapest. And then just a couple of days ago, I've crossed over the border into Serbia, where the people are absolutely adorable. They're just gorgeous. You, they couldn't, they're so friendly. You just can't be, feel a stranger here. And so I'm on my way now. And there's the, 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 the route, just to tell you, is that I'm going from here to Belgrade, I expect, but then to say hi to the capital of Serbia. Then I'm going to uh, Sofia in a uh, in uh, Bulgaria because I have a little project going with the Lufthansa uh, technique people in Budapest that want me to go and see their people there because this little car thinks she's an aeroplane even though she goes five miles an hour. And so after that, I'm going to Istanbul. Then I'm going to run the length of Turkey. And then I've got to go to Georgia, to Baku, and then probably across the Caspian Sea on, on from there. Although the route will eventually take me hopefully to the high Himalayas and to Kashmir because there's a school there where 200 girls were killed in the earthquake and they had a 
big struggle rebuilding it. And there's a school for the blind people I have to see. And then there's a long road to Nepal and Kathmandu and to see the work of Phase Worldwide itself and then on from there. But the most, the two most important things, Sarah, is that one is that this is not at all a very fine journey. It's just that it's the one I know is important because um, how can I say the last time I ran around the world, I went nonstop and it took five years and it was extremely difficult. However, I've discovered that real life is the biggest adventure everywhere. And also, like I've got a beautiful daughter and a wonderful son and some two great grandchildren already much smarter than me. And also when I go to schools and talk to kids, I don't want them to I used to think if I do something difficult, then they'll think they can do something difficult. But actually, it's not like that. It's that we all have to do many things at once. We're all women are famously good at multitasking, but everyone this in this day and age particularly needs to be multitasking. We've all got families or someone we love, and we can't just say goodbye. I did that far too much, but in, on the other hand, my family were behind me the first time I ran around the world. But I love them dearly. And also we all have to work because work is a great way to say thank you to life. And also we have our dreams and they all go together. And I think everything helps the other. And people used to say, well, the way I, I manage is I get my confidence by realizing that even I am amazing. But I find that I get my confidence because I can think, wow, how amazing this person is and that person is. And it really makes you very humble. Anybody, man or woman, that does an adventure that you can plan in advance like this one, it's very easy compared to what goes around and goes on everywhere. And now I'll take a breath, Sarah. I'm so sorry. I don't know what you're going to do about the editing. No, hey, don't apologise. It's absolutely fascinating, Rosie. I love hearing you talk. And I'd love to know more about where your passion for running came from. When did that start? <laughs> You're such a clever woman. You're just lovely. <laughs> I tell you what, because the funny thing was, I was the one that was an embarrassment. Uh, I was a fairly awkward, my grandmother couldn't walk, you know, and I was. she brought me up anyway. I myself was a backward, awkward kid. I didn't even speak English till I was about three. I didn't go to school very early. I was the, I wanted to shine at sport and be a wonderful runner and but I was the worst, you know, I was gawky and, and horrible and I would I was slow and sometimes my knees would go out of joint and I would faint in church and be dragged out by the knickers or off heels or something. And I was told by the PE teacher that you'll never amount to anything. And I was so unhappy and I was only ever in the slow bicycle race or the sack race in sports day uh, because it didn't need heats. I was just useless. And so basically I gave up running because I, I, I connected it with pain and discouragement. However, when I was about 48, I'd been to Albania uh, just on a kind of walking plus buses journey there after the end of communism in Albania. And like so many people, I'd got an idea that, you know, you fight darkness with light. And there was a school there where the kids had no books and etc. So when I came back, I thought, well, you can get sponsored for running. So I joined at the tail end of a, a race, a 10K race in Tenby. Wales where I lived and I really was at the back and I really stood next to this old lady and she looked fairly frail I thought well we can commiserate and I said to her have you done this before and she said not this one and she shot off and you know I made it and I got all my family to give me some sponsorship and I think I came last but I felt I'd won and I felt it was a whole new era because then I met the Tenby turkeys who were these crazy gorgeous runners in Tenby and I remember for some reason deciding to do the London Marathon the year after I'd started running and realizing what a completely stupid crazy idea it was because I hadn't improved I was still no longer did I collapse or anything but I was still very slow and awkward and I remember hearing that patter of feet uh, behind me and these lycra clad gorgeous guys came up and they said oh hello they said we are the Tenby turkeys uh you're not doing too badly you're doing pretty well and I thought whoa you know and then they slowed down and ran with me and they said well you know you can only be a you can only be a Tenby turkey if you do a marathon uh, you can be one too and I felt like like the ugly duckling that was going to become a lovely amusing turkey instead of a swan and uh, so everything started from there and then uh, some years later uh, a, a few not very long later maybe only a 
a couple of years later, I did the Swiss Alpine Marathon and met my foster mother who looked after me. And then I did the Marathon de Saab and Clive, my husband. Oh, I'd done sailing, as you know, in between. And one of the projects had been sailing single-handed to America in a very, very cheap, well, 500-pound sailing boat, little cutter. And I'd met Clive then, and he was the love of my life. So we had had, you know, after, before – before I started running, we're already living in Tenby, and it was like an island in time of joy and happiness. And when he partly retired, he was going to take up what he'd started doing videos and gone to the Sahara Marathon, and he'd had a got a little job, very just a maybe it was about 50 pounds or something, but it was the local telly, and it was very exciting, and we were on a roll. And uh, so so I met him after the boating business, which is a long story in itself, because I had to dress up as a mermaid on the front of a disreputable gentleman's magazine and lost my reputation forever, but gained the good sales and sailed to America. But after all that, and despite that, Clive and I had got married and were very, very happy and settled in Tenby, although we went on many wild adventures together. And then after that race, he got a little pain in his nether regions and he never was sick. He had literally had not been in bed for sickness since he was a kid with some fever in India and it turned out to be prostate cancer. And so um, he, he fought it really bravely and it wasn't the cancer so much that it had, but the fact that it had spread to his bones before he'd had any symptoms. And so after he very sadly died in my arms I felt so strongly that you know I, I, he died at home and I just held him and held him and then I felt a light had come on and he was free and had his strength and I just felt I had to go on a journey and, and do things for him you know and also raise awareness about cancer and so that's what I did and that was and that the first thing it taught me is that I had no strength but the great thing is you don't have to use your own strength you can use other people's strength and it was the beginning of a way of thinking that I now think if I have a that the little tricks you learn in really tough situations are also very useful in awkward but less important situations like you know if I'm having if I get covered in, in insect bites like last night I just think of a lovely moment with my family and I feel better. And I did the same at minus 62 when I was in, in, in Alaska and it was very hard to stay alive. I used to think two things. I used to think that you could dip into the past like a treasure chest and use great moments to keep you going for tough times. Then I realized you could also dip into the future. You could imagine the next lovely thing you thought was going to happen and you can take strength from that. And also I realized that you don't just have to dip into the past or the future and borrow it and become a little time traveler for, for putting bad things right or for minimizing problems or for helping your, your brain do it physically. You can do it at good times. Like in my past, I've had one or two, very lucky to have one or two great times. But often, you know, I've never really thought about them too much till later. And I think it's important to 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 make the most of every moment. And uh, so that's what I'm doing now. And I believe every every single minute is an adventure. I believe every day you should wake up and start the day by being grateful for something. And you should, uh, it's not about how to be a good person. It's how to actually do your own achievements. This is totally selfish because truly, if you just do something for someone else, you just feel better straight away, don't you? And uh, you know that, you know, if you you, you can't. It, it, it isn't. It's the teamwork, isn't it? People say it's all in the mind, and this great word mindfulness is very powerful and well known these days. But it's really a teamwork. Otherwise, you just say, ne "Never mind the training. We'll just use our minds." It's everything is teamwork. We're all part of each other, and we're all part of different parts of each other. And you know, you're part of my journey, Sarah, and so are all the people who be listening to this. And I. I'm sorry, I probably speak to too few people because I've been alone at the edge of a cornfield all last night talking to my friends, the mosquitoes, who are incredibly fat around here. Not at all. I mean, you said making the most of every moment. What is life like for you being out on the road? Like, what are your days like? Well, it's a very, very great question. Again, why I like being out on the road, apart from the fact I'm hoping it does a bit of good for the for the kids in, in Nepal, etc., is... I love it because it is full. 
I mean, I many of your many adventurers do far better things than I do, uh, but you can and and some and anybody that has support or backup, that's great. It depends what type of journey you're doing. But for me, this is a pretty hardcore journey. Like I've. I have a very small budget. I have my pension and a very small amount of other money, and but for joy, I just I would stay in a in a hotel or motel very increasingly rarely. Usually, when my batteries are a, a beat, which they probably will be after the day, but and also to clean up. But I can use the skills. I'll tell you a typical day in a minute. But I can use the skills I learned in Siberia and in Alaska. Uh, for far easier times here with no problem. For instance, what I do is I usually wake up early and I, around here, I cowardly, I wait for the first daylight because the mosquitoes are really bad. You know, they truly love insect repellent and they adore company and they love to snuggle up. Trouble is they love to, <laughs> to eat you. <laughs> the wolf got it. You know, the bear's got it, but the mosquitoes never got it. You don't need to eat me. So anyway, I get up at daylight and I look out because then the mosquitoes suddenly go away. And then I open what I've got, some lace curtains, which are really a mosquito net. But a lovely young Hungarian friend of mine, she made me a mosquito net out of her old lace curtains. So I pull up my lace curtains. And last night I was looking out onto the moonlight and the starlight. And it was absolutely gorgeous. And right now, my biggest uh, sorrow is I cannot get my stove to work because I'm spoiled. It's a multi-fuel stove and I'm used to good quality fuel. And now I've got really smelly petrol, which is very unpredictable to use and slightly dangerous. So what I've been doing is creating cafe au lait by having the three-in-one sachets, putting them in my water bottle, shaking it around a bit. And presto, you've got lovely coffee, even though it's not hot. Then I eat things because I'm greedy. I just eat that moment is apples and cheese. And I always have bread and Himalayan salt. Uh, plain bread, uh, you know, the more basic, the better, with some Himalayan salt sprinkled on it is an amazing snack because you need some salt in the heat and that's full of minerals. So I had that. And then comes the washing. And the washing, it, when I was uh, on the Bering Sea up in, near Alaska, I used to realize it was perfectly OK. I could everything was very short supply, but I could melt a, one, just a pint of water or a bottle of water from the snow. And then I could really wash really well, as long as I had a piece of Parisian soap, something delicious and lovely. And so basically the most important first thing to do is to wash all over and preserve every drop of water. Because then, you know, I would I would keep that water in a different bowl because I'd be using it to wash my socks with after, or maybe one sock. Because one of my book of crazy tricks that I keep working on is you can't wash lots of things because then they stay gritty and they're just worse. So if you can wash one sock and dry and kind of recycle them, that's the three sock trick. And then I then I just try to uh, look where I'm going and I check the phone for charge. And today I had to get up and, and phone my server, which is a very a very good English server. For five pounds, you can buy a day's data, but you can't buy phone minutes. That's, that's what I'm talking on you now. So that's very good value. I did all that. And then I just like, and this has been, took me all my life to learn. Instead of rushing off, I'd like to just sit, be still for a few moments and just breathe and listen to what's going on around me. And it's so valuable. And I tell people to do this. I flew to Shanghai last during my run to Berlin for three days to speak at a big business conference and they're all stressed out and they're all terribly busy and they might think it's crazy to spend three or four minutes just doing nothing but that three or four minutes gives you multiple strength and and also you just feel happy in your body and your thoughts and your decisions come from your belly not from your head or maybe both you know it, it's funny isn't it the mind has to work freely, but the mind is never the boss. Somehow it's the spirit or something inside every person. It's not to do with religion or culture or race, particularly to do with everyone everywhere. And a butterfly has just flown past. They're always perching on my shoes. I don't know why that is. But so I do all that. And then I set off running. If I put, I'm, I'm always desperate to send emails because I'm working. I'm trying to do a few 
uh, hand-picked speaking engagements, as well as lots of ones for charity when I can, as well as run. So I have to try to write stuff and do things, but I also have to try and run before it's too hot. However, I'm conquering this because I'm getting more used to being too hot. And honestly, it's not killed me yet. You know, so basically, and I try to use, even though I have very little, I've got very good quality stuff, like a good sleeping bag, only 400 grams in this time of the year, uh, for very good people. And I, I, I saved my life, a bigger form of it, at minus 60. And, you know, my hair, I hardly ever wash my hair, but when I do wash my hair, I, I have some organic hair shampoo. Uh, and, you know, it really pays because my hair is all bushy instead of being thin like it's meant to be. The brain's got thin, but the hair's fine. And basically, you've got to look after yourself. And if I have any type of oil from coconut oil to olive oil or any sort of moisturize i just lather it on my body and then i always put if possible some good sunblock on oh, <laughs> i can be short of it <laughs> there's there's just a question of trying to keep everything going and uh looking after yourself and i was uh you know well it took me t I, when i went to lufthansa in budapest it took me two days to look tidy enough because i'd really felt i looked so terrible i managed to buy a cheap pair of trainers and a new cheap top because in the end everything gets dust colored however much you wash it so there you have an insight into my life and inside of ice chicks got my family all pictures all up my son james my daughter eve some of her friends the cat the dog a little picture saying piglet how do you spell love poo you don't spell it you feel it which always brings tears to my eyes and inside there's sheathing silver stuff so that the heat doesn't get in and there's a little lightweight uh on take on board suitcase which i keep my stores in and if i have to fly off somewhere to do a talk i can put stuff in it and uh currently i've got a little just a little pair of flip-flops i can put on i've got three teaspoons and one saucepan and several little bowls one little red bowl which actually is just the size of a normal washing bowl but i call it my jacuzzi and it's absolute heaven if you put some water in and you splash your feet it's almost it's just lovely and that's my life sarah i don't know i love it why do you have three teaspoons that feels like that's a little bit of um, extra weight there well it, it really is because i had two and then i lost one and then the one i i didn't lose i was ever not finding it and it was really annoying me so actually quite i found a, of all things a tesco and i don't they're not sponsors or anything i found a tesco in uh, hungary and i, I bought a, I, I bought you had to buy five see so i got i gave two away for fun to the two kids but i've still got three which is rather overkill admittedly but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but I mean, I don't try to, I have heavy things too. I've got some amazing solar packs from Power Traveler, which to me works better than the panels you stick on because you don't have to have a big battery in it. And uh, I've got a reasonable phone and uh, I have a little cheap phone as well somewhere because I lost my phone, which was a bit of a drawback. But, you know, in the end, you've got to overcome things. So I, I, I'm all sorted out again now. Absolutely. I mean, there's obviously you're going to go through tough times when you're out on the road and you would have been going through you, you would have already gone through so many different tough times already in your life how do you keep going where do you think this determination comes from well I believe that you know there's you're talking or the people who are listening or will listen to this podcast if you ever manage to edit it bless you Sarah it they all got huge spadefuls of courage, ability, everything. Everyone's got everything. But me, I just I suppose the fact is that I truly love what I do. I love to be home. But in the end, at, you see, I'm a different age than I used to be. So basically, I'm... I'm going to be 73 on the 2nd of October. Honestly, I feel 20 or 37 at the, on a bad day. I'm so blessed. And now I, I, can't, I can see myself being at home, being sitting on a sofa, nagging the grandkids. Or I can see myself trying to do the things I love for as long as I can and hopefully inspiring them and mix them all up in my adventure. But their adventures are even better, you know, because they are far, far more high flying than me already so i do it for love i don't try to imitate home life as you might call it outside i try to 
imitate outside life if I'm at home. I like the feeling of being the. I, I just like to. I just love what I do, and I love the fact that there's the camaraderie of the road. Everybody's sweet and kind and lovely. I was even helped by two convicted murderers in Russia. Uh, and even people who seem very dangerous, like once in America, I was surrounded by a whole gang of people about oh, three in the morning and they were all very, very drunk and were on drugs and they were shouting and yelling and they were saying they'd kick the cart over. But in the end, you know, I just got talking to them and they were fine. And in other words, I think that I do it for love. And also I love the adventure. And I was brought up to it in a way. My dad died when I was fairly young, but I remember walking across a forest with him somewhere in Europe and, you know, making, uh, baking some potatoes in a, in, a, in a little fire all those years ago. And my grandmother always said, you know, you don't have to be defined by your past. And it's a well-known thing these days, but it's the truth. You know, it's always how you res respond to things. And I'm basically happy. I wouldn't mind being cloned into being about 10 different people because I also want to be home. And it's hard doing multitasking because I've got to earn the money to be going home. And then I want to, uh, my, I, my, uh, well, my grandchildren are hoping to come out to deliver shoes and things to me at some places. And also I've got a kind friend that actually comes out from uh, now and again and, and leaves things. Logistics are quite difficult, but basically um, I'm just grateful for every moment and every day because my mother died when she was in her 30s, I think. I don't even, even know her, but it must have been 30s. My father died when he was in his 40s, had a hard war. My, my Clive died when he was exactly the age I am now. Uh, and he'd had two very bad, tough years. And, you know, I just think I am so grateful. But the, the, one th the one best way to make the most of your life, they say we're all on a one-way journey in life. And we all have to make the most of it. But the very, very, very best way of making the most of it, and this is nothing to do with being unselfish or a good person. It's just that it's so fun to be part of other people's lives. Uh, and, and you know, so basically already I'm excited. I can still, I can already smell the Himalayas in my lungs, and I'm looking forward to meeting the people there. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just an ordinary, happy person. And everybody's nice to me. And in the evenings. If I'm in a village, I always chat, even though I don't know the language, I manage to chat to all the local people and we have a great, it's fun to meet them. They're always very, very nice. Oh, Rosie, is, I love your life and I love the fact that you love your life as well and the fact you're so happy doing what you're doing because I have to say, I don't think I know many ladies who are in their early 70s who are smashing it like you are. What, what's your oh, friend? Lucky. You are very lucky. What do your friends and family think when you're, you know, when you sort of say, well, oh, actually, do you know what? I know I've just got to Berlin, but I'm going I'm to carry on to Kathmandu. I know. I felt, I do feel a little guilty. However, my, both my son and my daughter, they know. My daughter puts it like this, and she's very, very smart. She says, you know, you have to get in the right size sweater you know, in life. I mean, if you keep struggling to be someone you're not then you are trying to fit into a, a different type of pullover. Oh, I won't be comfortable. Uh, basically, they know I'm at my best. However, this is why it's extremely important. I'm going back to see them uh, on my birthday or shortly after. They are involved in my life and I am theirs, but I can do better. It's probably better for them that I'm strong and fit and doing stuff than if I'm sitting in an old folks' home and they've got to visit me. I believe very much that at every stage in life, you go out to the world. You don't wait for the world to come to you. And I'm conscious of being so lucky that I'm so old and honestly so full of energy. And because I was never a great sportswoman, I don't notice my disintegration because I never had an integration. <laughs> I mean, I was never fast. I, w I was never much good. But of course, I learned you can keep going. And I genuinely love love the sound of the wind in the trees and the little animals. I'm not afraid of the dark. When I was a kid, I used to have to milk the cow in the winter and then the torch would go out or lamp lantern in those days. So I don't mind the dark and I don't, I'm not afraid. Fear is multifaceted too, isn't it? There's a great deal of people say, give up fear, uh, like false evidence appearing real. But that's crazy because fear is a, is a huge teacher. 
And some fear is stupid, like, oh, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm frightened of getting old, I'm frightened of dying, I'm frightened of, of various making mistakes. Those are all stupid. But you can be frightened of dangerous traffic any day. And if you're stalked by a wild animal, however adorable it turns out to be in the end, I trust you, your heart will thunder because you never know what's happening next. So, um, yes, I just think that I like to tell people that there are different ways not to give up. They don't have to think that they're strong or special or to change. Everybody's already got the space of the world inside them for ability because, as I say, they can always think of someone else to give them strength or something that they've done in the past. And they just have to make one little step. There's, it's, it, it's me. There's always days, even me, but not so often. But certainly after Clive died, you can be in bed and curled up in the ball and you don't want to move. There's people, it takes more power for them than their minds, not their physical body even, to get out of bed to start the day. It can be terrible for people who are in bad circumstances. It can be so damn miserable, you know. So all I can do is try and help as many people as I can and have a lovely life too because you don't – my grandmother always said this. She did have a tendency to say, not about me but her children, well, you know, I just suffered so much to bring them up. I did this. I did that. Well, I like to say that my – you know, you, that people are happy you know, let's be happy doing the things that we have to do and and proud of our families. I could not be more proud of my family. They're absolutely fabulous. If they said, Rosie, we want you to stay home, I suppose I would stay home. But I don't believe that I could force myself to be as strong. I don't know why. I'm just... I'm, 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 uh, I just, I, I like to be on the go. And when I can't be on the go anymore, who knows what will happen? You know, it's life never lasts forever. Everything has an end, and that's okay because it just makes you treasure every moment. You know, and I know that I've got to do my family, my dreams, my work, write another book, and run around the world again. Because in the end, I'm 73, and I may not be so good in, in 83. I may lose my entire brain next year. Or on the other hand, I might still be running around the world at 100. None of us knows what the future will hold. All we can do is help each other or rather enable each other this helping is like i'll give you something enabling well catching your first little fish with your fishing rod seeing your first plant grow i've had experience of how great that sort of stuff is so anyway too many words clive would say rosie darling shall i take a breath for you oh Rosie, I would say you're one of like the first female adventurers, you know, going back to what you've done and what you've achieved and been achieving over the past 50 years. Can't believe I've been alive this long. Yeah. <laughs> what, what do you think has changed over the, you know, oh, in, well, in, in the world of adventure for women? Well, a lot, a lot has changed. First of all, a, the world of adventure there are lots, there's so many great women, great young women as well as great older women doing amazing things everywhere you look in the world today. I can't, I couldn't even, there's so many, many, everywhere you look, people, women are wonderful. People are wonderful. Uh, what has happened is that there actually is more perception of how valuable freedom is for women and how tough it still is for women in many parts of the world, especially in remote parts where, you know, how can you do, spend all your time collecting water or doing things by hand? How are you going to, you know, do the rest of the stuff you want to do and how, how precious freedom is? Also, because of the iPhone, uh, things have changed. I mean, as recently, though this is not very recent now, when I ran around the world from 2003 to 2008, all I had was a sat phone and limited access to it and 60 characters, including spaces and only emergency calls if you were lucky. And now we've changed where we can. And I sailed across the Atlantic. It took me 70 days by myself. And I didn't speak to a single human being for a month and a half after I was nearly capsized. Whereas now, if I was doing it now, I'd obviously be trying to give regular updates on Facebook, Twitter, or my family, or a blog, because it's a great way of sharing things. This hasn't always been possible. Um, I believe I've never been unhappy at being a woman. I'm really pleased. I think it's a great if you are a woman, as long as you're born with the, with the, with the knowledge that you can do anything, that pe people believe you can. But 
life is so miserable. Apparently, this school in in Kashmir, there was great, great opposition to having it rebuilt, to having girls educated, because they're so much more useful to be at home doing chores, basically, you know, and it's that means chances are lost. And through history, there have been many exceptional women who've done the things, but how many countless women have been denied the chance just because they're stuck in a kind of slog? And nowadays, with divorce and broken homes or a million other things you can look at and just sheer poverty, p- women are still stuck. So you are leading the way with this podcast. And I think toughness is softness. I believe softness and love is the best form of toughness. You know, I believe these, you, you just need to be loving and giving is the best form of determination. I used This is a new way of thinking for me. I used to think you just had to grit your teeth. And now I think you just have to feel something more than that yeah Rosie how can people support you on on your journey what do you what do you need people to do like can people send you money via paypal can we pay for your you know yes for hotel rooms yeah, or buy you a burger no. or ice cream on the road how what would you like us to oh, do you are so kind to ask this basically what what I'm doing I I I very rarely uh do things for for charity because I don't like coming money very much, although I didn't make a quarter of a million. I didn't, but I mean, other people did on my behalf when I ran around the world for a prostate cancer charity. The first people, oh, I also did something, I did 27 marathons in 27 days some years ago for a children's hospice in Wales, which is appalling that you should need one. But mostly I just, like when I was running across America, I just didn't do it for a charity. I did it for any local person that wanted it. When I ran down England, I would be having a ice bucket challenge or something stupid in every pub and the, the, there'd be a whip round and the proceeds would go straight to the people locally. But this is so important and I'm very bad at being sponsored. I, I hate to do it. But, but yes, if anybody's kind enough to sponsor, you know, for any amount, no matter how small, if you, I think it's www.rosyruns.co.uk. Otherwise, ask Jonathan because honestly, I've made... I've done very poorly with, with raising any money. I don't know how to do it. I hope that because I was so old and stupid, people would sponsor me. But maybe, you know, I'm not doing anything very, very tremendous. I'm only running to Kathmandu, but I would appreciate support. Apart from that, I'm fine. You know, occasionally information is very handy. Like now I've got the dangerous petrol and I have no idea how to get back anywhere to buy some uh, a camping store and things like that. But I'll probably find one on the way. And then you can learn if you have to do without. So I, all I need is a smile. And if you can possibly sponsor me or at least call the charity, the Phase Worldwide people that put you in touch with me, I'd, I'd support me. Be very, very kind. Because up to now, I think I've only made, oh, very little. <laughs> it's all Because I don't collect money on the road. I don't know what to say. But that, yes, please support me. But just support me for those children in Nepal. It would be great. When are you going to reach Kathmandu? Do you have like a planned or rough estimate of when you'll arrive? I have a, well, when I go, I go quite well. Like even these days when I'm stopping and talking to you, I should be doing a half marathon a day uh, because it just adds up nicely. And that's easy. And I had to do a marathon a day getting into into Vienna, which nearly killed me. (laughs) I looked like a a dead person walking up the streets in in Vienna. But uh, I don't quite know. I believe I will be, I'm going to Istanbul. I have to go home to see my, well, I want to go home to see my, my family. I believe I'll be in Istanbul in the new year, maybe early new year to celebrate Istanbul, which should be a, a big landmark. And then I don't know, but I will be going seriously. What I mean is I, apart from coming home and if I got a, if I only got a, Oh, another thing people could do, if, I'm not a very good speaker, but I think my stories are, ought to be a little bit interesting because I've got lots of stories to tell about wolves and bears and even the naked man with a gun and much more. The things you can do for me is please sponsor me, but also consider engaging me as a speaker for any price at all. Because if I can make a few talks together, like two, three or four, and fly home, that 
I like to earn my living rather than be given money. You see what I mean? So basically, I'm going to keep going apart from brief stops. If I come back to Britain to see family and do talks, this will only be for a few days at a time. And although the logistics take a while, like just leaving my cart and getting back by bus or whatever it is, I I will be, I should say I'm in Kathmandu next, uh, this coming year very easily. And I, and I can only give you an update because I don't know what's happening quite in Georgia and Baku. But I won't be hanging around more than I have to. I'll be going steady on, if you see what I mean. Does any of that make sense? It does make sense, absolutely. So we can continue to track your journey. And I'll make sure that I put all of the links to your social media and to your website and everything. But Rosie, have you got some time for some quick fire questions? Absolutely, my friend. I'm sorry I've been going rather non-stop. I'm delighted to, to have any questions. Well, please, honestly, I, I love hearing you talk. It's absolutely fascinating. I'm just gutted no, we didn't get... I'm a real badass. I apologise. No, no, no. Please don't apologise. I was going to say, like, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't get to talk about the wolves and the bears and the naked men. Like, we'll have to save that for another podcast episode well, or, well, I... or people will have to go and buy the book. <laughs> Are you a morning person or an evening person? I am definitely a morning person. What time does your alarm go off? What time do you wake up in the morning? I don't have an alarm. Uh, I I go, my routine is prescribed a little bit by the weather, including the traffic weather. That means I usually stop early, about 8 or 9 p.m., because then it can get dangerous. People are tired. The lights may not be good. Uh, so I go to sleep early, about 9 or 10, maybe, after working a bit. Then I wake up about two and then I think I could be wonderfully lazy till 4 a.m and I stretch and drink coffee and have a lovely time and wash and that and then I like to get going about five o'clock and I don't need an alarm clock I I don't need one it all works in my mind for some reason what book are you reading at the moment well I've been rereading some of the old books I've read you know I, I just absolutely I I I love Steinbeck, you know, all those old classics. But I've got a new book of philosophy coming my way in the next few days. And I'll let you know which it is. It's going to be very good. Apparently, this guy is very into nature. And, you know, I can, I mean, without being airy-fairy about it, I get real comfort from the trees. Do you know trees, their roots underground, an ailing tree can help a healthy tree. Apparently, they do things we don't know they do. I did know that. <laughs> I have a young friend. Yeah, I have a young friend uh, uh, in, in, who is involved with Phase Well Wild. He's made a film called Plant Blindness. Like we always notice animals, of course, but we don't necessarily notice all the plants are doing. But anyway, I'm just happy outside. So this guy's written something about a thousand years ago on nature. And I'm, that's the book I'm getting the day after tomorrow. And I'll let you know what it is. But now I'm rereading all the old classics and then I give them away. And what about movie or film? Do you have a favorite movie or film that you love? You know, I'm very, I'm hungry for movies. When I, if ever I stop, like I'm in a in a little bar or a cafe in a village, I'm glued to the TV because I don't, I, I, I do not have enough electric power to have movies. Not really. You know, I'm very busy. But what I do have is music. I love country western music and I love rock and I love most forms and I love lots of classical music too. I always treat myself to some music in the morning, which is gorgeous. I don't see many movies. I'm out of date. When I go back to England, I shall hope to have an intensive going to the latest movies that are out, you know, catching up on the century because I love it. It's great fun. But I can't do it on on the road. It's just too everything is everything is very limited. It appears not limited, like I'm talking to you freely, but really everything is limited. I've got well half a bottle of water, but the next village is only ten kilometers away, and you know I can't. I don't have enough elect. I don't have enough power. Uh, I can't. I have the money to spend every night in a hotel, and I have to, I have the time or really to stay with people too much because in the end at night's my time kind of space time for writing and recharging and um so I, I mean i can stay in a hotel and i can stay with people but mostly i just curl up in ice chick so electricity is limited so i don't have a favorite movie and Rosie, do you prefer the mountains or the beach uh i'm tough you ask tough questions don't you um <laughs> You really do. Oh, by the way, I'm a decadent person, and I believe decadence. I just want to put this, interject this: decadence saves your life more than 
pushing yourself to the limit. If you look after yourself, you're much better off. So I'm always having parties in my mind and drinking nice big glasses of wine in spirit when I don't have any. Uh, I'm really a mountain person at heart. I admire mountaineers so much. There's some amazing people out there doing stuff that can, you know, just makes you in awe. Uh, I don't, I, I love the sea, but I, I'm not, I, I like beaches, but I don't like them that much at the moment because I'm always so hot. You know, I can't imagine sitting out in the sun, but I'm, that's only because my imagination is small. I'm sure I'd change my mind after a few, you know, dull rainy days, perhaps. What is your favourite type of food? At the moment, it's, well, it's a Hungarian goulash and goulash soup, which is cheap and readily available. You see, food is a funny old thing, isn't it? I could not have survived in Russia if I'd eaten what you call a, a, a proper diet because I could not have carried the food. I've been conditioned by my single-handed voyages, I suppose, that I can eat the same thing forever. For instance, right now I'm on spaghetti, except I can't get the stove to work, but I'm on spaghetti with sort of bolognese sauce, and I, but I could always add fresh ginger and fresh garlic. And uh, even if you do eat, I, I like to power up my food. You know, basically, if I have pot noodles, I, if I, I've been through a village, I can always buy an onion and some garlic and some fresh ginger and maybe a handful of green stuff and mix it into the pot noodle. That's if I don't have enough gas to cook seriously. But, I mean, I can eat the same old thing. I had, in Russia, it was buckwheat. Uh, honestly, apart, buckwheat and garlic and lumps of fat. How does that appeal to you? Oh, <laughs> It was pretty horrible. But, you know, basically when you're hungry and that's what the people eat, uh, me, I, I'm very, I'm very, I often don't eat meat. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a vegetarian, partly because when I was in Alaska, I was conscious of how the huge, huge forests only survive because very occasionally someone takes an animal from it, but, it, you know, uses every bit of it. And therefore it's left alone and they have the habitat of a billion creepy crawlies and little things that actually make the world survive. But uh, on, in principle, I just, I eat any old thing, to be honest with you. <laughs> and, and I'm greedy. I, I, I'll always eat uh, when I'm hungry. And I actually, I'm, things like just bread with salt on it, bread and water sounds terrible prison diet, but as long as I've got something to eat, and I hate being hungry. I've had to be hungry I ran out of food five days before I got to America because in those days I was more inexperienced and the salami sausages had burst and the potatoes had exploded and that things hadn't gone quite to plan, what was being nearly capsized. But um, with food, crossing rivers in Siberia, again, I had a hard time with food. Uh, I just like dislike having no food and when i'm out when i'm if i'm asked if i'm at home i can't think of anything nice and a lovely big glass of red wine and and beautiful salads and yes love it and rosie i'd love to i'd love to leave our listeners with your final words of advice and top tips for other women who want to make sure that they live their life to the fullest what would you say to those women listening well, I would say, don't be afraid. Just go for it and go for it in a small way to start with. I, this might sound crazy, but I was thinking about your possible question this morning. And I was thinking, I, 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 spend a night out. And literally, I mean, if you live in a house, let's say you live in a house, a nice house in somewhere, right? And you've got a bit of a garden plan uh, for one night, This it, it, make a decision and get the tent out and spend the night outside in your garden and look up at the stars. Or, but basically, remember that if life is precious and you, the way to think to make the most of it is to do the extra. It doesn't have to be a big thing. You don't have to be setting off around the world or maybe break up your family or do something. You just have to do a little extra thing and your family are part of it. Do that little extra step. And if you can't do it for yourself, do it for someone else. If you're having a rubbish day, make someone else's day. But just don't be afraid. You know, you're stronger than you think. Everybody is. Don't be afraid of, of life because in the end, after all, you've got to live it to the full because it will not last forever. It doesn't matter how careful you are. Just look after yourself and look after other people and take the extra step. Go for your dreams. You don't want to be 90 and looking back and thinking, oops, I wish I did that. You don't want to be doing that. So you should go for it. And it could be anything. It could be an inner journey. It could be a private journey. It could be something you don't even tell anyone about. But you go on it. Absolutely. Rosie, thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast to share more 
about aspects of your life and the journey that you've been on and your run to Kathmandu. Absolutely inspiring stuff. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for, for giving up your time and best of luck with the rest of your run. You're definitely one of my heroines and you take care of yourself too, Sarah. It's been an absolute pleasure and a joy talking with you. Tribe, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Rosie. Honestly, I've sort of got no words. I mean, just what... She's just the most lovely lady to speak to. I mean, wow, what a life that she has lived. What I mean, she has just lived her dreams and her philosophy and, and how she's so grateful and happy and positive and determined. I think she's just an absolute inspiration. Everything that Rosie has talked about, I will be including in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. I'll make sure I include links to all of her social media and to her website, rosierunns.co.uk. So please do go check it out. Please do please do go and give her a sponsor. I thought that was so sweet when I was asking, you know, how can we help you? Can we pay for some hotels? Can we, can we pay for food? And she's just like... Oh, just a smile. <laughs> She's just so, so lovely. I, I really, really did enjoy that conversation with Rosie. Just an in- incredible woman. To everybody who is supporting me and supporting the Tough Girl podcast by signing up as a patron, your financial support every single month makes such a big difference. Signing up at $2 a month, $5 a month, it really does change the direction of the podcast. It allows me to, to fund my to fund my life, to, to fund the running costs, and allows me to create this content and to share more of these incredible stories, which hopefully motivate and inspire you. So let me just ask you these questions. Has the Tough Girl podcast motivated you? Have the Tough Girl podcast inspired you? Have you changed your life because of the Tough Girl podcast? Do you listen to the Tough Girl podcast every Every week or do you save up and binge to like five or six episodes at a time if you do please consider paying it forward two dollars a month one pound 47 or one pound 60 something like that a month it would make such a big difference so please do go check out patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash tough girl podcast have an amazing day wherever you are just give it your all give it 110 percent, and just go for it ha- make sure that you are living your best life possible because like rosie says don't you don't want to wake up at 90 years old and look back at your life and think why didn't I do that do it now do it today take that first step you can make it happen you're the only person who can make it happen you've got to live your life for you all right take care lots of love and I'll speak to you soon bye <laughs>